Here's an idea. Quantifying yourself helps you build knowledge about your body, but it's not perfect knowledge. So in the last couple episodes, you might have noticed I started wearing this thing. It tracks my steps, sleep, food, exercise, and then I can look back on the data it gathers and feel guilty about being a lazy jerk who looks at the internet all day. No, but really though, I did hit my step goal six out of the last seven days, so watch out Usain Bolt. Having just started to wear this thing, I thought it would be interesting to make a kind of before video, as people sometimes do when they're starting a new exercise regimen or diet or whatever. And if my feelings change drastically in a couple months, maybe there will be an after video. Who knows? So I plug this thing into my phone and it builds a kind of portrait of me out of very friendly infographics and facts and figures. Like last night I slept seven hours and 30 minutes. I had deep sleep for three hours and 23 minutes. Today I have walked 5,644 steps and consumed 705 calories in three beverages and three food items. The idea is that this will provide me with knowledge about my body that I do not get from simply being inside of it. Paired with embodied knowledge, like my back hurts or I feel really energized, maybe I will be able to learn something and live a little healthier. That actually is the premise of the quantified self, that data about or from your body, usually gathered by gadgets, will lay bare and inspire you to improve your body temple wonderland. Your body is a wonderland. And it doesn't stop with this thing or tracking simply your steps and sleep. Quantified self can mean you're tracking all kinds of things like your mood, golf swing, blood pressure, heart rate, power output, menstrual cycle, you name it. Quantified self, henceforth QS, has a kind of post-human twinge to it, and that as sensors get smaller and change from bulky systems into tiny devices, they get closer to, and probably eventually inside, the body, and produce data about it. In a way, it's kind of like big data for one. Some folks have even called it big individual data. Other folks still have described the quantified self as an alternative to big data practices. Link in the doobly-doo. But QS does have some of the same characteristics that make big data, and really any process involved data worth considering closely. First, in a blog post from I'm not sure when because they didn't put a date on it, and that always makes me nervous, data management group Analect wrote that the most interesting thing about all of this self-data is crunching it to discover new and interesting things about ourselves. Notice that, quote, the most interesting part is knowing and not doing. Meaning, after looking at the numbers and knowing, oh hey look, I burn more calories shouting at Dark Souls 2 than I do reading a book, Am I done? What do I do with that information? This is what quantified self-scholar Whitney Aaron Bozel, who we last quoted in our Introverts episode, describes as the difference between quantified self lowercase and quantified self title case. Lowercase QS is about having and knowing the data. Title case QS is about knowing and using the data. Girl, look at that body. Practitioners of the latter, she writes, don't just self-track. They interrogate the experiences, methods, and meanings of their self-tracking practices and of self-tracking practices generally. Otherwise, quantified self can be nothing more than conspicuous gadgetry, lazy to obsessive self-surveillance, and who knows, maybe inadvertently involving yourself in some kind of scary corporate insurance plot. I wonder, because I honestly don't know, of those who own a gadget like this, are a majority title case QS or all lowercase QS? My gut says the latter. Maybe because I think that's where I fall. And this, weirdly and roundaboutly, is related to the second data conundrum. How is all of this data collected and displayed anyway? Meaning the jawbone, the Fitbit, the whatever, the objectivity of the information upon which they crunch is only a shade of such. For lots of people, scientists, programmers, people who watched our algorithms episode, this isn't exactly news. The transition from data to information is not a net zero process. There will always be some stuff left over, some stuff lost, some stuff Stuff shoehorned. But even data, which we normally think of being raw before it is cooked, so to speak, doesn't necessarily paint some veil-piercing, truth-bearing portrait of reality. Dana Rosenberg writes in Data Before the Fact that from its first vernacular formulation, the existence of a datum has been independent of consideration of any corresponding ontological truth. When a fact is proven false, it ceases to be a fact. False data is data nonetheless. Am I then saying that QS is false and therefore useless? No, not at all. I'm just saying that the stuff in this little app is constructed. And at least insofar as we're talking about a quantified self reliant on mass produced retail technology, it's necessarily built on assumptions about bodies, which is neat. And I think worth considering, especially if this thing is going to produce data that you want to use and not just stare at while sitting on the couch. Not that I know anything about that. In other words, in measuring yourself, you are creating like another self, a self in numbers. And you are strongly encouraged to compare that self in numbers to an ideal self in numbers, or maybe your other gadget wearing friends 
in numbers. You should have walked another 3,000 steps. You slept four hours less than the recommended minimum. Your heart rate is a little fast. Good calorie intake, though. Your friends' virtual bodies and the system's nebulous, perfectly active body provide a measure for your physically present, maybe kind of squishy, and only sometimes active body, and you should try to match or best them. This feels remarkably like yet another way for me to compare my body to the body of others or to some ideal body, except in this case the reference is numbers and not, as Laurie Anderson calls them, the underwear gods. Am I then suggesting that we shouldn't try to push ourselves or that a baseline of fitness is a bad idea? No. No, 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 not at all. No. I'm just suggesting that body competition seems to be the focus of most fitness-related self-tracking technology, which makes a lot of sense because body competition is the focus of, well, a lot of things. Gary Wolf, the founder and coiner of Quantified Self, said in his TED Talk that if we want to act more effectively in the world, we have to know ourselves better. And I could not agree more. This thing has taught me so much interesting stuff about my life and my body, but it doesn't really seem to operate in a context that emphasizes effectiveness. If anything, it seems to emphasize measurement and competition. And maybe that is the biggest difference between mass market fitness QS and the rest of the QS field, which is huge and includes things like homebrew systems and small batch tech. Or maybe this kind of thing is inherent to any expression of this kind of technology. In a conversation with Catherine Hales at the Metabody conference, Jaime Del Valle suggests the possibility that the quantified self is engendering additional, quote, systems of control. To which Hales responds that it is, like anything, much, much more complicated than that. And I totally agree. That does seem super alarmist. Especially if you consider things like apps that let you track your insulin level or your menstrual cycle. Though there is certainly some biopolitical aspect to all of this data gathering. That doesn't mean that it's not also liberating. At the very least, in the sense that this little thing is liberating information about my own body. What do you guys think? What does effective self-tracking look like? In what situations is it inspiring? And in what situations is it oppressive? Let us know in the comments, and I'll give you two guesses about the thing that we track. Get subscribers. I think if I got to choose my own superpower, I would go with being very lucky, and then I would go to Coney Island and I would beat everyone at ski ball. Let's see what you guys had to say about Miss Marvel and media representation. Scott Hudson wants to know whether I felt any amount of discomfort being a straight white guy talking about the importance of representation in media, and the answer, Scott, is yes. Tons. But, uh, you know, I had lots of friends helping me with the script, um, with things like perspective and language, and we reshot um, a bunch of stuff more than we normally do, uh, just to try to make sure that we were getting things as right as we possibly could, because, you know, we think it's important to talk about this kind of stuff. Um, and to answer one of your questions specifically, I think that you don't necessarily want to speak for um, a group of people, but you can make a case for the importance of representation and other related points without speaking for someone. And that was a thing that we tried really hard to do. Tried really hard to let Sana Amanat speak for herself. Tried really hard to let the letters column speak for itself. And, you know, with the format of the show, it's hard because it's just me on camera. And I think, you know, we could have done better, but I like to think we got close. Like, the episode is not perfect, but like I said, I think it's important stuff to talk about and we tried to solve exactly the problems that you are writing about. Trollinator2 says that it's important to not force creators to make characters of a certain underrepresented race or ethnicity or religion or background, and I want to be really clear that I'm not saying the world or media is going to be a better place just automatically if we get rid of all of the white characters. Um, I think Joy L wrote a really great comment about how representation is at its strongest and probably its, its most important when underrepresented groups are not only in the media we consume, like the TV shows or the comic books, but they're also in working in the industry, that they are the people writing and producing and directing. And that is when those stories about these people, much like what happens with Ms. Marvel, become real and identifiable and 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 meaningful. And that is that is what good representation is. That is what the best version of representation is. And I totally agree with that. To Danny Ha, yeah, we we really dropped the ball on this one. I got so excited about including Seek Captain America that we tried to find the first place where there was like an empty asset slot and it just happened to be during a line that suggests that he is Muslim, which he is not. Of course, he is Seek. Uh, I apologize for accidentally inferring that Seek and Muslim are the same thing, which they are certainly not. 
So yeah, my bad, sorry. Leon Sandler writes a comment saying that good representation does not automatically make a good story, which is a thing that I totally agree with, um, but I also wanna address lots of the criticism that came up about the Bechdel test, which I'm not giving a total pass, and I'm not saying that if a movie passes or doesn't pass the Bechdel test that makes it either good or bad, but rather, if a movie does have more than one female character and they only talk to men or to each other about men, I think that that is a good starting place for a conversation about the quality of the writing for women in that movie. The Bechdel test is far from perfect, but it is a very good starting point for conversations. So that's why we used it. Megan1137 talks about having to find representation wherever she could because the media landscape was devoid of it. And um, yeah, this reminds me of, there's a part in Sana Amanat's TED Talk where she talks about how the X-Men are the only thing that she sort of felt a connection to because they were misfits in the same way that she felt a misfit, which is, you know, especially interesting because the X-Men has come under lots of fire for appropriating like a civil rights narrative for largely white bodies. So this is, it's like this, like layers of an onion. There's a lot of complicated stuff when you, when you don't have uh, someone who you feel is, is you in the media. Hank Hill talks about her experience as a Pakistani Muslim woman um, and how she felt as though she needed to abandon her culture after moving to America because there is no touchstone for Americans about why, you know, where she comes from, um, what she has to be proud of. And yeah, the idea of feeling like you have to abandon your culture because the people who surround you don't, don't get it um, or, you know, just don't appreciate it is, yeah, it's really, yeah. I, I don't know what that feels like, and but I can imagine it's awful. So th yet another case for good representation in media, a thing I never considered. Thank you for sharing. Thank you, Chris Crotagini, and to anybody who didn't notice, we, there are now half a million of us, which is just, which is bananas. And uh, to answer your question, Chris, if I could ask everybody to do one thing, I would ask them to um, try to understand or defend an opinion or idea that is the opposite of one that they hold. Just because I think it's good brain exercise. And then I would ask them to go vote for us on the Webbies because we got nominated for two more Webbies. So that's cool. It's been a really emotional week. We hit half a million subscribers, got nominated for two Webbies. We're about to hit our hundredth full episode. I, I, I need to lie down. All right, this week's episode is brought to you by the hard work of these quantified selves. We have an IRC, a Facebook, and a subreddit, and the tweet of the week comes from Mike Becker, who points us towards a website that will tell you how much time you have spent watching a particular television series. I made the mistake of measuring how much time I spent watching the entirety of Cheers. I don't recommend it. And for this week's record swap, we will be losing the Beach Boys' Surfer Girl and replacing it with Ravi Shankar's Improvisations. So, adios Surfer Girl and welcome Ravi Shankar. We're gonna make that more straight later.